Hello. How are you? Thank you, Dina. And uh, I know Nancy is here. Nancy was here this morning, so I thank you, Nancy, for for having me. Uh, you know, this is a really important session, and when I knew how many people would be here, I didn't realize the room would be so small. So I, it's good to see everybody packed in close together. This is how we save money at USAID. Uh, so that that's wonderful. Um, I want to thank some of our colleagues from IFPRI, Paul Dorash and Mark uh, Fritzler, who have helped put this together and uh, and co-sponsored this. And of course, I missed the opening uh, discussion, but I heard a lot about the central themes from that uh, conversation in IFPRI's synthesis and presentation of best practices in this space. And so I'm eager for that to really uh, infuse our thinking as we have this conversation today and as we do the work in this space over the course of the next several months and years. Uh, I also want to thank Ambassador Alkana Odembo from the Embassy of Kenya. Is he here? He's on his way. He's on his way. OK, good, good. But uh, a couple of references I'll make, of course, are to, to Kenya. And I know this room is packed with experts uh, in the Horn of Africa in particular and on agriculture, food, humanitarian response, resilience. So I will tread lightly on some of these things, knowing full well that our USAID team and our colleagues from other agencies and other parts of this space are here with much more expertise and can build on this. Uh, it, is, it is really, uh, we're at a very unique time. And I don't know if I, right. So we're at a very unique time once again in the Horn of Africa. And the central theme I'd like to uh, the central point I'd like to make today is that our opportunity to demonstrate that we have learned a lot about building resilience into vulnerable communities and building sustainable food systems across larger economic units, whole countries and whole regions. Our ability to demonstrate that we've learned in that space is the way we react in the next several months and years to the crisis in the Horn of Africa. And this is, of course, a, a photo of uh, the Dadaab refugee camp. And when I had a chance to visit Dadaab a number of times this year, I was just struck by the constant growing size of the camp, now nearly half a million people in a settlement designed for 80,000 people, I believe, originally. And at the time, growing on a, on a daily basis. Welcome. Uh, and so, as you see in this photograph, th these are women and children, mostly, who've completed 50, 60, 100 kilometer treks from South Central Somalia into Dadaab. And as we know, this is the result of the combination of weak and uh, abusive governance in Somalia of uh, the worst drought in more than six decades, of generally low performing relative to their potential agricultural systems in the region. And uh, as a result, for the first time in quite some time, more than 13 million people have suffered from acute hunger and the risk of hunger because of these conditions. Now, it's of course, you've all seen the, the illustrations of the fact that the famine itself, defined by the case fatality rate amongst children, is acute in parts of Somalia and South Central Somalia. But it's important to note that there have been significant challenges in uh, otherwise robust settings in Kenya and in Ethiopia, with catastrophic loss of animals, widespread displacement, and acute malnutrition rates in some parts of northern Kenya, up to 37%. Thanks to the leadership of President Obama, Secretary Clinton, and uh, so many members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, we were able to mount a significant humanitarian response. I think the United States has accounted for more than 50% of the global humanitarian response to the Horn from the beginning of when we started getting early FuseNet data demonstrating the risks that, and the challenges from what was coming. And we're proud of that strong response. Uh, this is a photograph we took in, uh, in Dadaab. It's a food distribution. And as you know, in addition to providing 
traditional commodities, corn soy blend. We've also really restructured the food mix we provide so that there are now nine new, I, I'm constantly told not to call them plumpy, so I'll say plumpy style <laughs> products produced by Georgian peanut farmers in some cases and Ethiopian chickpea farmers in other cases. But they are high nutrition, high value uh, product that has a long shelf life and uh, can be targeted to vulnerable populations, pregnant women, young children in particular, and you all know the data about the impact of that transition. We've been proud to be part of that transition and take that very, very seriously. But the whole package of interventions has been necessary, and frankly, from regular to therapeutic feeding, has made a big difference. We've seen a constant, I believe, uh, five-month decline now in acute malnutrition. Uh, we've seen that malnutrition cases that did surface had an 83% cure rate, eight points higher than the traditional international average. In some of the hardest hit regions of Kenya and Ethiopia, we're seeing malnutrition rates drop to pre-famine levels now. Uh, for instance, in Marsabit County in northern Kenya, acute malnutrition levels declined from 27 to 13% just last month. So we see some real progress because of a, of a significant and aggressive humanitarian response coupled with uh, local government, the Kenyan government, the Ethiopian government, taking strong and specific actions to make sure that that assistance reached vulnerable populations and frankly have been taking actions for years ahead of time to build resiliency in, uh, into those communities, which we'll get to in a moment. So this is the map of the crisis in July and August, and I suspect you all have uh, know this better than, than uh, I, certainly. And you can see the areas that are classified as famine, the areas that are classified as emergency. And of course, everyone in this room recognizes that a famine designation is not a food availability designation. It's, a, it's more complex than that, but it also really does capture the child uh, mortality rate on an acute basis. And that's why, oh, th I'm sorry, this was, the, right, so this, yes, this is October, December. Let me see if I have the other one. Okay, good. And, and so you've seen that what we saw, the trend that we saw was a widespread emergency and a very localized famine that then grew into uh, a larger area of uh, designated famine, but the area that was where there was able to be a successful humanitarian response was essentially downgraded because of the effectiveness of that response. And I would note that even in some famine-affected areas and Shabab-controlled areas, we've seen some significant improvements in food access, in food prices, in child acute malnutrition uh, rates and in case fatality. So we've actually seen the response be effective in a number of different settings, some of which, you know, that frankly I think we all probably debated whether or not um, the response in some Shabab controlled areas could be as effective as it had been. And together with the OIC and with a range of other partners and most importantly with local groups, I think it's been it's been very, as strong as it could be given the difficult context and difficult situation in which they're working. Now, I know that everyone here is acutely concerned about the removal of certain humanitarian groups just a week or 10 days ago, and we will continue to stay very focused on making sure that individuals, families, children, women in acute need uh, have access to life-saving services and opportunities for aid and assistance. Uh, but it, so it's not to say that we're on a natural path of resolution here. It still will take a lot of work on behalf of the humanitarian partners. But I do want to talk a little bit about, because I know today is really about resilience, about the concept of resilience both before and after this crisis, where both before and after are difficult to define. So let's talk about the concept of resilience um, throughout uh, this situation. This is a, a photograph of Kenyan pastoralists receiving insurance. Uh, the insurance uh, that they receive is via an index-based uh, livestock insurance program. And it's 
this uh, coupled with programs that we've seen in India and parts of Latin America with weather uh, indexed insurance, satellite monitoring, independent verification, easy payment, uh, clear terms of policies are one of the big breakthroughs in offering tools and technologies that can improve resilience for vulnerable communities. This past October, at the height of the drought, insurance pay payments were made in this specific pilot to more than 600 pastoralists who had purchased coverage for their animals earlier in the year. And ultimately, this is part of a project that partners with Swiss Re that is expanding access to those types of insurance programs in seven other countries around Africa in different agroclimactic areas, obviously, because that's how they decouple risk and how they're able to offer a large-scale insurance program. It's interesting when I get a chance to talk to American, uh, groups of Americans that fully understand the role of the United States government in providing risk protection for farmers and ranchers in this country. They get it right away. You don't have to have a conversation about humanitarian development, resilience, have these long conversations. You don't even need to do it. You just say, what's the most important thing the federal government does for you? And it's they provide risk mitigation in a business that to this day in this country is inherently defined by the risk of the activity. And obviously it goes without saying in much of the horn, you don't have the kind of large scale public risk management programs. And maybe those that have been tried have been less effective. But this model of partnering with private sector insurers, of coming up with independent verification, of figuring out how to deliver a private sector product to a very small uh, economic unit or a household is taking off in parts of South America, in South Asia, and certainly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I expect this will be, and I hope this will be a big part of your resilience thinking going forward. This is a child in the Dadaab refugee camp, either who just received, actually judging by the look in uh, his eyes, maybe he's about to receive vaccinations. <laughs> My son just got his vaccinations and he, was, he wasn't that happy afterwards. He was pretty upset. Uh, I was struck when I visited the camp there, and I think this is a great testament to the leadership of the Kenyan government. Uh, that they have introduced uh, not just the full suite of basic vaccines, but uh, Hib vaccine, Haemophilus influenza B, and Pneumovax. Pneumovax is a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine that up until quite recently cost $54 a dose in this country, even though it's been accessible to our kids for quite a long time. It's estimated that almost all of the life saved from this product around the world will be outside of the United States, of course. Uh, but we have seen almost no uptake until recently, and this year President Obama, together with other world leaders, made a significant multi-year pledge, brought the price of the vaccine down about 80 percent. That was in May. This is in September. This child is receiving this vaccine in the Dadaab refugee camp. So it's another example of something you know, that modern technology, health, and public health interventions are a core part of a resiliency agenda. And I'd urge you to expand your thinking of what resilience means to include these kinds of low-cost, high-yield public health interventions, because we know that the fatality rate as it relates to negative consequences like, like the famine uh, are more closely related to health interventions than even food interventions uh, based on the 91-92 data coming out of Somalia. Now, there are a lot of other parts of the resilience agenda I'm not even going to try to get into. Land management, verification, uh, the ability to save assets for women and men, uh, the ability for children to have basic education, the whole full range of things that we consider basic developmental priorities. I hope one of the things you're doing today is having a discussion about which are the most valuable in which settings, because ultimately we all will have to make tough resource trade-offs as we invest in a resilience agenda. Um, but I would urge that the kinds of public-private partnerships that allowed Swiss Re to backstop these insurance pilots that allow, I think it's GSK, but it could be someone else, to offer this vaccine product at an appropriate cost, and that will allow uh, farmers in the region to have access to micro-irrigation or 
improved seeds and appropriate fertilizers are the types of things that you ought to really think about as part of resilience and as part of building that in going forward. And that brings us to an initiative that this administration has launched and that many of you have worked on. Certainly, I see Susan and Beth and other folks from our team, Cindy and Laura, that are, have helped shape that we call Feed the Future. And when President Obama launched Feed the Future in 2009 at the L'Aquila Summit, the basic point was recognizing that for decades, the world, and the United States included, had stopped investing in agricultural development for all practical purposes and had actually maintained some amount of investment in food aid and humanitarian assistance. But on relative terms, we weren't doing enough to help people recover fast enough, to help people get back into the business of production and marketing, and to help people do that in a way that was responsive to the realities of what it's like being a highly diversified, smallholder, female-led farming household, which is the characteristic that defines so much of the production system in the Horn of Africa. Feed the Future was our effort to change the way we work. So we increased our core investment from $235 million in 2008 to $1.2 billion this year. We partnered with multilateral organizations. We've I think appropriately, but been criticized for being a little slow to move in countries because it was important that countries developed their own country-led plans, that the AU and that CADAP in particular uh, ran an effective process to make sure that those were inclusive and vetted and appropriate plans, and then presented those investment plans to us, to other donors, and to the World Bank, but from a position of leadership and strength. And, uh, and in fact, that has happened in so many countries throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. This is a photograph, of course, of a, of a woman farmer uh, in Ethiopia. Now, since 2003 in Ethiopia, the government has been expanding its services to small-scale farmers, helping them uh, receive benefits and helping them receive improved seed technologies, improved fertilizers, uh, and extension support so they have more knowledge and insight as to how to improve their production. Uh, they've also, of course, engaged in a comprehensive safety net program together with USAID, the EU, and the World Bank. That program targeted households in 318 districts, helping to provide basic food stocks and other asset building resources to families that needed that in order to get to a level where they could both improve their production and uh, focus on protecting their household through difficult, risky periods going forward. And we've seen that that kind of an effort has contributed to helping millions of people not require basic humanitarian assistance during this crisis. And I know there's some debate about, is it four and a half million or seven and a half million? But the bottom line is, those are massive numbers. And the fact that we can say that that program has effectively protected that number of people from being in a position where they have to seek humanitarian assistance, in addition to its basic value of providing dignity, um, is laying the groundwork for real economic development and, and agricultural development. I, in our humanitarian responses, we've tried to build that kind of transition to recovery in from the very beginning. And in Pakistan and Somalia, in both cases, uh, right when we're simultaneously providing humanitarian assistance, we've also tried to support efforts to give people seeds and tools to go back and plant. And at least in Pakistan during the 2010 floods, that basic effort led by FAO and supported by us and a few others essentially helped save the Pakistani winter wheat harvest, helped directly support their balance of payments position come February and March because uh, wheat prices were at an all-time uh, high at that point, and they were fortunate to have had a very, very strong uh, production cycle post-flood. We're hoping for a similar success in Somalia, as we've once again supported, again, I think it's FAO, to help uh, support a, a more extensive planting effort. So I'll just conclude by, and that's the let me, let me, before I conclude, do this, because this is my favorite slide, even though everyone tells me I shouldn't show it. <laughs> I don't know why. They say it's a bad graphic. 
but I love it. This is, the, <laughs> this is uh, our Feed the Future results framework. And it's basically our uh, integrated approach to collecting data and information on the state of agricultural production systems, agricultural dependent poverty and vulnerability, and some basic concepts of resilience. And I know this will adapt over time, but as the US government, we've made a commitment that every part of our government abroad will feed into this and allow us to, in a couple of years, be able to say, this is what US investment abroad leads to in terms of improved outcomes on food, on hunger, on chronic malnutrition. And uh, we just believe that transparency and that outcomes reporting is very, very important. So uh, let me just conclude by saying that I, uh, I think the work you're doing here is incredibly important. Uh, because for too long, we have segregated humanitarian support and activities and development activities. And we haven't seen the beauty of the possibilities that exist when we think of these things as a more integrated whole. Nancy and I have been having a debate about what to call that more integrated whole. If resilience is the term you all choose, then we're all for it. Uh, it took me a while to fully learn um, all of the different things that resilience has come to mean, because it means a family that has a basic asset stock so that it can weather some bumps. It means a woman that has access to a mobile banking account so she can save resources and weather the storm. It means communities that have programs in place that function like insurance would function, whether it's backed by private sector or public sector mechanisms. And it means that the moment you're handing out food to provide humanitarian support at the time it's most needed, you're helping a family think about how they get back on their farm, plant, and be part of uh, building their own future for themselves again. And that's a broad concept to include all of those things. But we are committed to using our resources to make sure that we demonstrate that we've learned a lot and that as we recover from the crisis in the Horn of Africa, we invest resources, planning efforts, and our uh, intellectual leadership in building a resilience strategy that is robust, that is country-owned, that connects to and is a part of our Feed the Future program and agricultural development strategies country by country, uh, and that really does represent the best integrated thinking of, uh, of all parties and all partners. And I know that in, is it March? March? OK. In March, we will co-host with EGAD and others uh, in Nairobi a meeting to uh, basically make sure that all of our to the extent that we can, that as many of our global funding mechanisms are aligned and integrated with a resilient strategy going forward. Because one of the first things we discussed here was how the humanitarian community has, uh, has the UN appeal system to raise money for crises. And the development community has everything from IDA credits to bilateral assistance to provide ongoing and continued financial support. The resilience agenda has not traditionally had dedicated funding and has had to piece it together from other sources. Um, and so we want to bring everyone together and say, if we're all really serious about putting our resources and our investments where we think the state of evidence and learning is, then we need to come together and make that commitment together based on the outcomes of these joint planning cells that are underway, the outcomes of what you're discussing here today, and, the, and most importantly, the outcomes of what our partner governments and partner civil society leaders in country believe they can accomplish against the basic goal of building resilience as a core development and humanitarian strategy. So thank you. I appreciate the chance to be here. And I look forward to uh, seeing the work that comes out of today's project. Thanks. Thank you.